listening to Inclusive AF with Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn. Welcome, welcome. This is the Inclusive AF podcast. This is Katie Van Horn and my sidekick Jackie is unfortunately in the air, so she is not joining us for this episode. Um, But luckily we have an amazing guest um, and they are really going to share some things about the work that they're doing and how they are pulling this uh, kind of forward, the the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion forward in their company. Um, And so I am going to turn it over to you, Sarah, to introduce yourself and share a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on Inclusive AF. Um, I am Sarah Reynolds. My pronouns are they and them. And I am chief marketing officer of an HCM technology company called HiBob. Um, Hi, Bob is the company behind Bob, the platform. Um, Bob is an all-in-one uh, HRIS solution for the types of companies who really care about their people. They're very modern and people first. Um, they are typically mid-size. Our customers range anywhere from 100 employees to six or 7,000 employees, um, and oftentimes multinational. Because as we know, uh, with the changing world of work, there are things that happen when your business goes global that just make your job all that much more challenging, um, not just in the DEIB space, but in other spaces as well. Um, so Hi Bob uh, and Bob are great solutions uh, to be sort of your partners in your growth trajectory as you grow your modern, mid-size, and multinational business. Awesome. Very cool. How long have you been with Bob? Um, I have been at Hi Bob since um, February of this year. So I used to oh, wow. say okay. in my intros that I was the new chief marketing officer, but I do think that the new kid smell is maybe wearing off at this yes. point. <laughs> you're in it now. You're you're very, very tenured. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, so I, I will ask, I'll start off with just asking, um, why is this, why is the the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion something that Hi Bob is focused on? Well, um, for many of our customers, and I, I know many folks who are listening into this, obviously diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are topics that dominate their day-to-day conversations. It's a critical topic of conversation in society. It's a critical topic of conversation in the workplace. And I think that the last few months or even the last few years have been a poignant reminder of how important it is and also how quickly things can change. So whether your business is uh, like ours, um, dealing with the conflict between Israel and Hamas, or you are still thinking about how COVID impacts your hybrid work policies, um, or you are thinking about how you can do better by the marginalized folks in your workforce who maybe are facing like new um, challenges uh, from, um, from laws being passed like here in the States, for example, I think that DEIB work is critically important to the HR industry. And I think as an HR technology vendor, um, we obviously have a huge role to play in being able to make sure that folks are supported and they have the tools they need to make smart decisions about, you know, how to really move the needle on DEIMB rather than, you know, maybe just talk about it. Um, I think personally, um, I identify as non-binary, I identify as queer, and I identify as disabled. And for me personally, Personally, that means that DEIMB is something that comes to the fore in a lot of my conversations, whether I'm talking about um, HR and talking to HR practitioners, or I'm talking about marketing and talking to marketing and communications professionals who are trying to make their own work more inclusive. Awesome. Uh, thank you. And thank you for sharing, uh, you know, kind of your own journey, your own, you know, kind of why this is important to you. I would love to know, we have had a, a couple of folks on that have been in marketing and, you know, talking about how do you prepare and how do you show up as an inclusive organization? And, you know, obviously the marketing topic is such a, a, a very important one, obviously very important to you and, and what you do, but how do you make sure that Hi Bob is showing up as inclusive? I think inclusivity is something that um, I'm really lucky because it underpins a lot of the um, brand work that we do. It underpins a lot of the the marketing that we do, and that started prior to me joining Hi Bob, but has certainly continued, you know, under my leadership. Um, when I think about, for example, you know, the the shapes that we use in corporate presentations, we don't use perfect circles or perfect squares. Um, every shape is a little bit unique because it reflects the beautiful, textured, unique world that we live 
live in. If you look on our website and you look at our little um, like cartoon figures, our animated drawings, um, I call them our bobbers. I, I don't know what, what we officially call them. Um, my team will kill me for that. Um, but our little bobbers, they represent people of all shapes, of all colors, um, of all abilities. That's something that the brand was already thinking about when, when I joined the organization. And we've been pushing that forward, not just in the communication that we use, you know, for example, adopting the singular they, um, instead of doing some weird work around that's like, you know, he slash she, or like guys, gals, non-binary pals, and those who prefer not to say, um, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to just use a singular they, for example. Um, but we've also been thinking about like how to make, um, inclusion more, uh, intersectional. And so we're thinking about things like, how do we make our website more accessible? For example, um, maybe in our brand styling, we have all caps font as, um, like a part of our brand headline formatting. Well, all caps font is, uh, not as easily read or parsed, um, not just by folks who have, uh, learning differences, but also by just the general public. So how do we take the opportunity to think about brand and extend the work into um, a space that's more inclusive? Of course, there's communications questions about, you know, what do you do as a brand when the world is looking the way that it looks right now? Um, how, how do you comment or not comment? But I think if I can give, you know, marketers one tip, it's that inclusion is a journey, not a destination. No company on earth, including Hi Bob, is perfect when it comes to inclusivity. And so we take the stance of, um, um, we want to share openly what we are working on. Um, and when we do things like choose to, um, you know, publish a pride filter for your profile picture in Bob during the month of June, it comes along with a blog post from yours truly about the things that I think we do really well. Um, and the things that I think that we still have opportunities to improve upon, because for us, it's all about making sure that our, um, our talking points on this topic are not just talking points. They're actually authentic representations of the work that we're trying to do every single day. Awesome. I love that. I think, uh, you know, I remember a time, you know, doing presentations and doing even like putting together trainings and working with the instructional designers on, okay, every person in this doesn't need to be a white male or a white female. There are other, you know, other people on the planet that we might need to actually include on some of these things. So um, I love the idea of using the the bobbers or whatever they are called, uh, you know, to to make sure that you are just thinking about some of those things and, and thinking about it differently. Um, I'm going to go a little bit personal, so uh, feel free to share what you uh, would like or or not. So one of the things that that you shared with our team was just around how do you dispel some of those hurtful stereotypes um, that kind of surround the LGBT LGBTQ community and beyond. Um, and so I would love for you to, to chat about that and, and share what you would like to share about that. Yeah. Um, I think that regardless of the population that you're talking about, of course, stereotypes persist. And I think that the reality is that like no group of people is a monolith. And so it's really difficult to apply these like wide ranging stereotypes to everyone, of course. Um, but I also think that it's increasingly important that we have a, an open conversation about what they are and how do we move beyond them. So for example, you know, if you're thinking about um, like starting a conversation about the LGBTQIA plus folks in your workforce or understanding even just what their employee experience looks like to maybe understand if some of those hurtful stereotypes or uh, misrepresentations or even something much more serious like harassment and discrimination is happening in your workforce. Well, it's a great place to start by asking them the question. Um, hopefully you have a strong partnership with your, um, your ERG. Uh, we call ours High Pride, um, which I'm the executive sponsor of, to be able to maybe have a close closed door conversation about what, what should you expect if you ask this question more broadly? Would you get an answer from your employees? Are they engaged enough or do they really think that you are coming at this from um, like maybe a point of trust? Um, and then I think it's a great opportunity to start that conversation, you know, whether it's within, within the ERG, whether it's through an employee survey, um, whether it's through other means, even just listening sessions in your organization where you can say, hey, we'd like to invite team members to share how they're feeling during the current time. Um, I know uh, we have about half of our bobbers in Tel Aviv. Um, and so they have been experiencing a very different 
type of situation than you and me over the last couple of months. And one of the things that our people and culture team has instituted is actually some listening circles where people can just feel free to share how they're doing, what's on their mind, um, how, how they feel the organization can best support them. And that's a mechanism that can be used for many different types of work in your organization, regardless of what you are trying to unpack. But I will say that regardless of the sort of like um, approach that you take, I think it's that culture of trust and transparency that you really need to be mindful of. And you need to think about, um, you know, how you're approaching these groups because you are asking them to do some labor in that conversation, right? You're saying, I don't know what's going on. you got to educate me. That's tough. Um, but you are also asking them to share something that's really personal. I can't tell you how difficult it is, even as someone who talks about their identity super openly, like I tear up when there are certain conversations that come to the table about the mistreatment that I've experienced or about, you know, how um, I get death threats on social media when I do public appearances because people don't like that I am who I am. That's really challenging. Um, and you should be really aware of that. And you should also make sure that the trust and transparency is there and that there's open communication about now that you have received this information, what are you going to do with it? If you're asking people, for example, to tell you if they identify as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, well, where is that information going to be stored? Who's going to have access to it? How is it going to be used to make decisions? So it's great to come to the table, not just with questions about, you know, how could we make your work experience or your life experience better? How can we help you move beyond some of the stereotypes that maybe you are bumping into still, even in 2023, 2024? Um, but also, you know, now that you've shared that with me, here's what I'm actually going to take action on and do. If I find that, you know, um, my employee engagement scores for members of the LGBTQIA plus community are real much lower than uh, maybe uh, folks who don't identify as a member of that community. Okay, well, what are you going to do about that? And how are you going to work with a group like your ERG to make that better? Or how are you going to engage your executives in a really productive conversation about moving beyond some of these things? I love that you're talking about that. And, and thank you for sharing, you know, kind of your own experiences. Uh, I think that for the folks who are listening, a lot of them are in the HR space. And this is a topic that we talk about a lot is data is great, but letting folks know how you're going to be using it, why you're asking these questions, some of these things. And also, uh, you know, from a global perspective, there are some spaces that you shouldn't ask because it will literally put them in the crosshairs of legal action or safety, all of these things, you know, from a physical safety perspective. And so I think that's, it's a great point to make of like, why are you asking the questions and what are you going to do with it? And also I think for so many, especially like smaller HR teams, everyone has access to everything. So being aware of those, you know, kind of guardrails for the security of that personal information is such a critical piece. And, you know, regardless of what tool you're using, how critical that is to just safeguard and, and and I will say the personal safety of the employees, but it's also just the, you know, the culture you're trying to build. If people feel like they can't trust HR, they can't trust their peers, whatever it might be, it is, you're kind of dead in the water if you're trying to do anything within HR. So thank you for just kind of going into that piece a little bit, because I, I think folks don't understand or, you know, maybe aren't aware of how critical this information can be and how important it is to safeguard it um, just to make sure you're keeping all of your team members safe and all of your team members really as a part of this uh, conversation and ongoing uh, inclusion work. Um, when you think about kind of the, the pieces that you want to see for HR teams when you are meeting with HR teams, whether that's, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of having a, a broad brushstroke here, when your team, your marketing or your sales team is meeting with possible clients or possible, you know, folks you're going to be partnering with, what are the things that are important to you to really be looking for, thinking about, or calling out to them as they think about their, their own cultures or their own companies? That's a great question. I have the great fortune of being able to spend a lot of time with our clients and I get to talk to them about things like this topic. And I get to talk to them about, you know, the broader sort of like 
business mechanics of their organization and how they compare to, you know, other folks that we're talking to or other Bob customers or, you know, what best practices they can implement um, and anything and everything under the sun. But I would say that there are a couple of things that um, continually come up. Um, one is um, like speaking the language of the business. Um, I I know from my own work as an officer in a company that speaking the language of like the spreadsheet people, um, like our friends in finance or um, our friends in uh, the executive suite more broadly, or maybe your board of directors, or maybe you have a particularly um, data minded uh, or, or P&L minded leader that you support, right? Maybe just as an HR business partner. Um, and sometimes you feel like I just, we're not speaking the same language, I feel like I can't get through to my GM um, because all they care about is P&L impact and, you know, like product delivery times and sales quota or forecast or, you know, benchmark comparisons or whatever your particular flavor of it is. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for HR folks to learn to speak that language of the business and to actually articulate the PL impact of the work that they do. Um, a lot of times we get hung up on, well, I have great, you know, employee engagement data. And I know that, you know, engaged employees are more productive. We'll demonstrate that to the business. Tell them about the productivity improvements you think that you can unlock for the organization. Or, um, you know, I, I have some data about turnover. We'll tell them about the cost that's associated with that turnover and what could happen if you could offset that turnover by, you know, improving your engagement by one more point, right? Or reducing attrition by one more point, right? Talk to them about what does that mean in terms of hard dollars and cents and how does it help you communicate that impact of people back to the business? Um, someone in my organization once told me that, you know, if you buy a piece of machinery, right? and you put it on your manufacturing plant floor, it's like a car. The minute you drive it off the lot, it's worth less. Your assets depreciate over time, right? Your physical assets in your business. People are the only asset in your business where the value appreciates over time if you take care of them, if you upskill them, if you invest in them, if you develop them, right? It's not always true. It's not It's not a perfect equation. You can't just let them alone and expect that they will deliver more value to your business over time, but they are an asset that can appreciate in value. And HR plays a critical role in helping them to, uh, to you know, increase the value of the workforce over time, especially as like the world is changing and, you know, we're having conversations. All right. I got through like, you know, 30 minutes of this without saying AI, but like, you know, we're having conversations that bring up these, these really challenging topics about how the only constant in our modern world of work is change. Well, people are the way that you're going to be able to navigate that change successfully. So you want to treat them like the assets that they are. Right. Um, I think the other thing that comes up a lot, especially in conversations about DEI and B is that people know they have an issue. They've known that they have had an issue for a while. Um, and the specifics of the issue, you know, can vary from region to region or from organization to organization really dramatically, right? But it, it all gets sort of like bubbled up under this um, umbrella of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. But what happens is that they um, they or their executives, they, they speak a lot about the issue, right? Like we know we have this challenge. We know we can't recruit um, skilled talent uh, who uh, isn't super homogenous in our organization, right? At certain levels. We know we don't have a talent pipeline for people of color or for women or for members of the LGBTQIA plus community. But when you ask them what they are doing about it, they kind of go, or they don't, they've tried a bunch of things, but nothing seems to have moved the needle. And I think for the most interesting conversations that I get to participate in are the brainstorming conversations about how are we actually going to move the needle? Um, there was like a really great stat maybe a year ago from Stacey Harris, uh, who's an analyst in the HR space. Mm -hmm. um, and she shared it in this big ballroom in Las Vegas at the HR technology conference. And it was about the number of HR leaders who share diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging metrics and performance outcomes with their C-suite in, in like a regular cadence. Mm -hmm. It was 0%. Yep. And you could have heard a pin drop in that Las Vegas ballroom. Um, and it's because you know, so many of us maybe don't know the answer, but there are great opportunities for us to network as, as HR leaders. There are great opportunities for us to look at what's working in other industries. There are great opportunities for us to even just have an open conversation and brainstorm about, okay, now that we have assessed that we have an issue, how do we actually move the needle to move us forward? Okay. That, there were like 52 things that I want to talk about. Sorry. <laughs> 
No, this is awesome. Um, I, I want to go back to the comment you made because I, I just want to reiterate it because I think it's such a critical comment and an observation that you know that people appreciate. And you know, while you might have a, a car or a piece of equipment or all of these other things, and you know, it of course starts to depreciate the moment it's off the lot or whatever you want to, you know, whatever analogy you want to use. But I love the idea that, um, you know, if you are investing in your folks and I talk to my team all the time and I think I, I sometimes freak them out when I'm like, no, this is like a resume builder project that you're working on. And they're like, are you trying to tell me something? And I'm like, no, I just, no. these are things that we all should know in HR and know how to do. And, you know, I think it's, it's great to, to have those experiences and to give your people those experiences to grow continuously. And. I think that's one of the the biggest levers that, you know, I think CultureAmp and others have identified in their engagement survey is like learning and development and not just, hey, I got to go to this training, but yeah. how am I actually learning on the job every single day? And so I, I love that you called that out. That's great. And then I, I want to go back to another piece on just the accessibility on websites. Um, and I, I think this is something that folks are struggling with, even just within like the careers page and kind of the mm. different places that we as HR folks touch um, that, you know, making them accessible. So I always I've switched everything over to um, Tahoma. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, um, because that was one of the the fonts that I was told, like, oh, that's easier for folks to read that maybe have a sight impairment of some sort. And, and I think there's just so many of those little things that we don't consider on a daily basis. But if you have a font on there that folks can't read or can't, uh, you know, discern regardless of what it is that, you know, whether they are, you know, have some sort of uh, dyslexia, whatever, um, how do we make that more clear? And I would love if you could just to, to share a little bit more or maybe some other, you know, tips, tricks, things like that, that you have learned through your career about how to make things more accessible. Because when we have these conversations on DEI, I think a lot of times we leave out the accessibility piece. And, and so any, what, what tips, what tricks, what are some of the things that you have recognized or, or figured out over the years that kind of help with that accessibility piece? So there's great resources out there. I'll give you some examples, but there are great resources out there if you want to learn more. Um, one is, I believe it's called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. There's no formal definition in the ADA, for example, the Americans with Disabilities Act, about what makes a website fully compliant when it comes to accessibility, right? But but groups like the, um, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines folks, they've been pulling together a lot of these recommendations. Um, and you can, you can reference sort of their work and understand, you know, what are, um, so fonts are like a great one. Um, minimum contrast is something that comes up a lot, especially when you're talking to, um, to marketers, um, because you're talking about like the color contrast between colors on your site. So for example, um, Hi Bob has this like cherry syrup color um, as part of our brand portfolio. Well, when you overlay, you know, white text or black text, does it actually produce enough color contrast so that someone who is colorblind or otherwise visually impaired can actually read the text that's on it? Or does it just look like a blob? Right. You don't want a blob on your website because suddenly that means that your website's not usable by that person. Um, you have immediately turned them off. Congratulations. Um, another great one is um, around like the use of screen readers. So um, you probably already have someone who's thinking about accessibility from a web perspective in your company. It's just that their title is not web accessibility guru. Their title is search engine optimization. Um, not always, but most of the time, good accessibility best practices are also good SEO best practices. So if you have someone in your company who thinks about how to get your website to rank on Google, they're probably already thinking about how do I structure data? How do I make sure that my headings are tagged as headings? It's not just a bigger block of text on the page. Like I don't just up the font size. I actually tag it in the code. That enables folks who use screen readers to actually go through and engage with your website either by reading the headline and then reading the content or tabbing through headline by headline to find what they're looking for. Great, um, great opportunity for you to sort of structure your content um, in in the in a way that's going to be more accessible, not just for Google's algorithm, but for people who need to read it that way. Um, you should also know one that I'm trying to practice is um, screen readers also like 
read out the URL, like read out the, um, the, the URL, if you don't use a hyperlink. So you have to sit there and listen to HTTP colon slash slash, like imagine that for the entire link. If you put that in, um, in an email or in a word document, you always want to use a hyperlink and you can actually that same thing where you nav between headlines to find what you're looking for. You can actually nav between hyperlink text when you use a screen reader, um, but that means that your hyperlink text needs to say what it links to. So if you just put here, then the person's going to hear in the document here, 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 right? You want to link what you're linking. Like you want to be descriptive in that. Same with, you know, alt text for images is one that comes up on websites and social media a lot. Um, emojis is a new one that comes up a lot. Um, if you re if you have a post that's like dominated by emojis, the person who is hearing it on a screen reader or other assistive device is just going to hear smiley face emoji, frowny face emoji, poop emoji, like over and over. It's not going to make sense, right? Because they're consuming the content differently than someone else might be reading it visually. You want to be really cognizant about, you know, how do you use some of these um, some of these new sort of like modern, you know, communication styles in a way that also makes space for everyone. Awesome. Love it. I, those are all great, uh, great tips. And I, I always like to learn when I'm doing this. podcast. So thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to go back to also the, the AI, um, kind of topic, because I think that's one that it obviously, it's dominating the news, dominating a lot of things. I don't know if you saw the uh, New York Times article that was talking about AI that literally had not one woman uh, in the entire article, um, which is a whole other topic of conversation we could dive into. Um, but what are your thoughts on AI and and how it will be used in HR? And you know, kind of what are the I mean, I think we all know the downfall and the uh, things to look out for, but what are your thoughts on AI in HR? So for longer than I have been in this industry, the topic of how we're going to automate away the manual processes in HR to free up our teams to do strategic work has been a topic of conversation. Whether you replace automate with algorithm or AI or, you know, whatever it is, it's an extension of a conversation that many HR folks are already participating in. And you might be surprised about how many of the tools that you already use in your day to day have some form of what we would now as clever marketers call AI. Um, you know, if you have a chatbot that helps with IT tickets or helps with employee benefits questions, well, you're using AI, you know, like I'm I'm doing a winky face there. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's just an extension of this conversation. But I think that the thing that we need to refocus the conversation about AI on is not the things that it will automate away for us, but in fact, what strategic HR really means when we have this hopeful ability to move beyond some of the manual things that maybe we don't like about our current job roles or jobs descriptions, right? Um, and that's true not just of HR, but it's true of every function in the organization. I think that HR has like the ultimate opportunity to become the AI and job of the future sort of like expert in the organization. A, because you already know what automation can do for you because it's been a topic in this industry for a long time. And B, because you have a command of like how, you know, jobs and skills fit together. Like what are some of those maybe like complementary um, skills that you can shift from folks who do one thing today into something that would be more valuable for the business? How are jobs going to change if automation or AI or whatever we want to call it um, fundamentally shifts the way that we're going to work? What is that more strategic work in each of the functions according to, you know, job description taxonomies about what folks do as they climb the ladder? Like there's a huge opportunity for us to reframe HR as the sort of subject matter experts if you come up to speed on what being a subject matter expert requires, because it requires you to not just talk about like, ooh, cool, shiny new AI opportunity automate everything, it also requires you to navigate difficult conversations about ethics. And it requires you to navigate vendor conversations and vendor selection conversations that are fundamentally different than the ones that you've been doing to date. It requires you to th think and talk about bias and how those things can creep into data sets or algorithms or you know all of the things that we hope that AI will come with. 
Um, it's a really critical opportunity, but you got to do right by your team because to be honest, you don't want to be participating in a revolution that's unethical or that brings more bias to the table than human beings, which is a pretty biased group of folks already. Awesome. Love it. So when you think about kind of, I, I, I'll, I'll say just marketing generally, when you think about kind of the future of marketing and what are the things that you are excited about and hopeful about? And then what are the things that you worry about? And it doesn't have to be AI. It could be anything, you know, anything related to marketing. Um, I am excited and hopeful about um, the work. I think that we do to, to make things more accessible, to, to be more inclusive as marketers and the conversation, albeit a difficult one that has begun to appear, you know, every time there is something like a pride month um, where we actually interrogate, you know, whether or not the actions in marketing are standing for are standing behind the actions of the company or vice versa. Do the actions of the company stand behind the actions? of marketers. I think that that's really fascinating. Um, I'm really excited about, um, you know, maybe this is weird to say, but I think that there's a tremendous opportunity in, in crowded markets, you know, like HR technology. There's lots of different ways to solve fundamental HR problems with all different kinds of technologies in your tech stack, right? Um, it's a it's a crowded market, but there's an opportunity to, to do some really cool stuff to differentiate yourself and to tell a great story about the value that you deliver to customers or, you know, to help folks understand why you are walking the walk when it comes to some of the things that you are trying to talk about in the industry. Um, I think where I get worried um, about marketing uh, in in you know, in the broad scope of things, I, I worry that like the internet is becoming unusable by humans. Like, you know, um, SEO, like content written by AI for consumption by an algorithm that determines your rank on Google. And then you get to the website and like our website has pop-ups, but like you get to the website and it's just like, pop, 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 pop. Mm -hmm. it's like, who is this for? Like I, I worry that the internet brought us so much like joy and community and, and for members of marginalized groups, especially like access to information that we would not have otherwise had. Um, if we make it unusable, I'm, I'm worried about that. I have significant concerns. Um, and then I, I do have concerns about, you know, how do we scale, how do we scale our businesses? How do we scale our teams, how do we make sure that we are prepared for that like marketing job of the future? Because I can tell you that I have been on the receiving end of, you know, the the similar comments that you might hear from business leaders who don't understand your domain function about how, you know, yes, we're going to automate all of your jobs away and then we don't need you people. It's not that we're going to redeploy you onto something more strategic. It's that you simply don't need to be here anymore. Um, those are really challenging conversations. And I think that especially at a time when our world is ever more complex every single day, if we don't really understand the value of people, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in HR, whether it's in customer success, whether it's in any function in the organization, if we don't understand the value of people to our businesses, then I don't, I guess I don't really know what we're all doing here at the end of the day. Awesome. Love that. Um, so what are some of the new, and I, I won't say features and benefits, but what are the new, like I did a demo of Hi Bob. It's now been, I think two and a half years ago, uh, after one of the HR tech conferences and, um, and I did not stop by the booth this year because I was running around. And uh, for those of you who did not attend HR Tech Fest in Vegas, I think they had like 500 plus vendors. So even getting around the hall was a little bit uh, bananas. Um, <laughs> fun, but bananas. Yes. Uh, but I would love to hear what are some of the things that your team is working on from a tool perspective to to set yourselves apart and, and to differentiate on this kind of DEI space? Yeah. Um, one of the things that's a big area of focus for us is obviously an analytics offering. So um, Bob is a modern HRIS. That means that we have lots of great core HR data, talent data, compensation data, um, data about onboarding and data about you know manager one-on-ones and goal setting and all kinds of stuff in your organization. We want you to be empowered, to be able to take a look at what 
is going on in your organization. It used to be like an affirmative defense that if you never looked at, for example, what was going on in your pay equity, um, like in pay equity reporting, then you couldn't be held accountable for that. Like pro tip friends, like that's no longer allowed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you got to look at it, right? Um, yeah. We want to make it easy for you to do so. We want to make it um, like really sim simple for you to understand, you know, what are some of those opportunities that you have to maybe close some gaps or to think differently about how you structure pay in your organization, just as one example. Um, we also, um, we've been doing a lot of focused development work around um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging reporting in particular. So moving beyond pay, right? You want to do some cohort analysis to understand, um, you know, why do we, um, why do we not see a talent pipeline emerge of early career leaders across all departments in our organization who are maybe people of color or who are um, women or non-binary people or who identify as any of the communities that we serve, right? We want to understand what's happening and we want to start to monitor those cohorts to say to the point about what are you going to do with your data? Now I know I have a problem. Let me keep track of this cohort of people and see if the actions that we take are going to actually move the needle on, for example, maybe getting more Latinx folks into management, right? Um, so we have some cohort analyses in our new DEI dashboards that allow you to do just that, which is keep track of um, any of the dimensions that you might want to measure against and start to understand the impact of your work over time so that you can begin to have that great conversation with the business about, you know, what is what is the value of all of this DEI work that we or DEIB work that we are doing? You know, why is it something that is critically important to the health and success of our business going forward? And, you know, every spreadsheet person's ultimate question, what do I get out of this? Um, because I think that it's really important for us to enable that, you know, smart strategic communication about every single facet of HR, but especially about something like DEIB work, which, you know, there was like a Wall Street Journal about like, is the chief uh, diversity officer position dead. And like, you know, people, people oftentimes, this is one of the first areas of budget that goes when you are asked to do more with less. And I want folks to understand why that is a big mistake that you should not be making in your organization, because this is strategic work that helps bring value to the business. Yeah, I thank you. I, I that that is, uh, that was a great answer. Good job. Um, no, <laughs> I, I appreciate that, because I think that is something that we're all facing right now in HR of, you know, where well, right now, especially we're all working on our budgets for next year, but thinking about, you know, where is that high impact? And I think there are so many ways that you can prove out the impact of being focused on inclusion, being focused on diversity and all of the kind of the different facets of whose voice are we not hearing from that we should be mm -hmm. hearing from. Um, because I think that's something that it does, um, it just brings a different dimension, but I love having the data to prove, Hey, this is why this is working. Hey, this is why we should be doing this and, and what impacts in a positive manner they are. So uh, I love that Hi Bob is focused on that and thinking about that. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, kind of the pay equity and, and some of those topics and, you know, obviously pay equity. Pay equity uh, will continue, I think, to be a, a topic of conversation for uh, years and years because it is a complicated one as well. Um, but, you know, I think right now a lot of folks that I'm talking to in the HR space are talking about the fact that their team members are saying, hey, we have all, all this inflation going on. Hey, we have all these different things. Cost of living is changing. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would say, you know, the economy is kind of leading us in a direction, but the communication about what's going on with the economy, um, I, I think is leading folks to believe that they should be paid more. Um, while at the same time, we have a lot of very large organizations who've done some mass layoffs. So there is a lot of great talent out there. So what are your thoughts in regards to pay equity conversations when you are in a market that is kind of difficult and, and kind of bumpy. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's two sides to like a discussion about is my pay fair? You know, an employee comes, comes to their manager and says, you know, I want to know my pay is fair. There's external competitiveness, which of course is very bumpy at the moment. And then there's also internal equity, right? 
Um, and you will want to have a conversation that is mindful of both of these things and mindful of the fact that employees now more than ever have access to tons of information, um, more than they ever have in the past about actually both of the sides of this equation. Um, on the one hand, they can go to a LinkedIn or a Glassdoor or a Payscale or salary.com and look up you know, some, some equivalency around what they should be paid to start that conversation about I'm not keeping pace with the market. They also are experiencing a true cost of living crisis in many places around the globe where inflation, like we, we can talk about it, um, at a high level, like from a boardroom discussion. Um, but what your employees are feeling is how to pay for their groceries at the, you know, at the week's end, right? That's a really different conversation and a really different like personal motivating factor than, you know, how is it going to, you know, adjust our returns or, you know, whatever it is, right, at the at the business conversation. And you need to be mindful of that because it drives a lot of sensitivity and it drives, you know, this this already very personal discussion to get to a place where it is really hard for employees to even feel comfortable like bringing up the topic because they feel that disparity. Um, on the internal equity side, you know, here in the US, for example, it's a federally protected right for employees who are not people managers to discuss their pay. So whether or not you like that is um, like irrelevant uh, because they're allowed to do it, right? And increasingly they do it more and more frequently. Like Gen Z is much more comfortable talking about pay than Gen uh, X, than millennials, than baby boomers, right? Um, you should consider it a normal part of the process. So if you do have some of those, like as an analyst friend of mine called them like warts in your pay program that you find when you start digging in on these pay equity analyses, your employees are going to find them too. Um, but I think the best way for you to overcome sort of all of these things is transparency and communication. So be transparent with employees about what your organization is doing. For example, in a world where corporations are recording record profits because they are increasing the prices of things at the grocery store, but not passing those profits on to employees. What is your organization doing differently so that you are helping employees deal with this true cost of living crisis that they may be experiencing? Um, what are you doing to look at market competitiveness more broadly for their salaries? How do you benchmark your data? Um, and then internally, like what, what are you doing to look internal to your organization? Like how do you conduct a pay equity study or analysis? Um, and more, maybe more fundamentally, how are you training employees to get them smarter on this conversation? And how are you training managers to get them smarter on this conversation so that any of these topics become less like emergency fire drill, um, you know, like, like 10 alarm kind of thing, fire alarm, um, and more a normal part of the business conversation where we actually all come to the table with an understanding and an education around how pay is determined, um, like what, what we can do to grow our careers or, or progress through, um, you know, salary bans in the organization. Um, what, what, what opportunity looks like at this company for me to take the next step and, you know, maybe make more over time, what are different pay ranges for different job grades, whatever, whatever style, whatever place on the salary transparency spectrum, your organization feels comfortable. Um, you got to remember that like comp people are, are the, the math nerds of HR comp is really complicated. Mm -hmm. You got to translate that for employees who are mostly getting the information from the news, from the internet, from their friends, from people who work in different geographies or different types of companies than they do, you know, they're, they are not the compensation experts that you might be in HR. And it, it actually benefits you to educate them because it puts them on a better, more stable footing for having a less, maybe like challenging conversation with your team. Awesome. Love it. Okay, Sarah. So what are one or two, Jackie and I always say one, but uh, we usually say 17. Uh, what are one or two things that you want to make sure folks heard during this episode? Um, I think one thing uh, that I could leave you with is that um, your marketing uh, leaders, your marketing employees, you partner with them probably already. You mentioned like pages on the website that HR has a stake in, right? Um, probably your friends in marketing are already thinking about inclusion and accessibility. Um, and they're probably thinking about it differently than you are. Um, the 
beauty of a diverse workforce where co people come from all sorts of lived experiences and all sorts of professional backgrounds is that you can tap into their knowledge and maybe learn something from them and share what you're doing so that they can learn something from you. Similarly, with your ERGs um, or um, your employee advocacy programs, um, if you have folks in your organization or if you're thinking about, hey, I want to launch a new project that impacts a member uh, or a specific marginalized community um, in my area, make sure that you're talking to the folks who are impacted. Don't have a conversation about pride washing your logo um, behind closed doors without members of the impacted community to understand how they feel about it and what you can learn from them in terms of what you should expect if you do something or don't do something or, you know, how you can navigate some of these really challenging conversations going forward. So I would say build some bridges, um, maybe make some strong partnerships, not just with marketing, but with lots of different employees in your organization so that you feel really confident that the strategies that you are putting forth are on accessibility, on inclusion, on um, like equity, that they are really representing the needs and requirements of your whole organization. Awesome. Love it. Um, I, there are like 15 nuggets that I would share. I think the one that is, is sticking with me right now is really the one around the uh, employees appreciate, they don't depreciate if you are investing in them and helping them and, and giving them the tools to, to get better and grow. And what a critical thing that is to think about, especially when you're talking to, as you said, like the CFO, the people that uh, want to know the numbers behind the thing. Um, and so I think that's just such a, a great uh, way to think about it, that if you invest in your employees, they're they're going to get better and getting better is, you know, what we all want for all of our employees and for ourselves. So awesome. Uh, Sarah, where can folks find you? Um, if you would like to say hi to Bob, you can go to hibob.com. Um, if you'd like to say hi to me, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at slash uh, Sarah Liz Reynolds, um, or you can find me uh, tweeting until the ship goes down uh, on the artist formerly known as Twitter uh, at Fair Pay Monster, uh, which is one oh, of my okay. my favorite things. And I will be so sad to lose it when that finally, uh, when that social media platform finally <laughs> does shuffle off to the grave. Yes, yes, yes. Have you started on threads yet? I haven't. Uh, I, I can't say that meta is, uh, I want more of my content on meta. Right, right. <laughs> true, true. I, I just love it because it hasn't yet been poisoned. The well has not been poisoned yet. And so it's still like this lovely place with a lot of like dog and cat images and oh. you know, people loving on each other. It's great. So um, anyhow, uh, thank you so very much for joining us. We truly appreciate you taking the time. And um, this is Katie Van Horn. And uh, I, I will say this is Jackie Clayton as well, um, just because she's not here because she's deciding to fly off into the uh, never ending space that she's in. Um, thank you for joining the Inclusive AF podcast. Bye. Bye.